Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, new uh, session of the FilmMat uh, seminar. Our speaker today is Justin Clark Doan, who's Associate Professor at Columbia University. His uh, book, Mathematics and Morality, was published by Oxford UP last year. And um, his um, topic today is Russell's Regressive Method in Mathematics and Philosophy. So, Justin, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. To Fabrice and uh, Francesca and Luca for, for inviting me. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, uh, what I take to be the, if anything, like the standard account of how we know the axioms in mathematics, what I'll call the, the Ru Ru Russell Goodall epistemology. Um, I'm going to discuss a, a, a very famous worry about that epistemology due to Benassaraf and argue that it kind of misses the mark. It's it's sort of objecting to something that this epistemology shouldn't be understood as trying to accomplish. Um, I'm then going to suggest a better objection that has to do with the disanalogy between mathematics and empirical science. And then I'm going to conclude um, with the sort of upshot for that disanalogy for the metaphysics of mathematics and philosophy more generally, or armchair philosophy more generally, you might say. So let me start with a view about how we know the axioms that I don't think anyone here will be um, uh, tempted to strongly buy. But just to get it on the table, what I'm calling naive Euclideanism. So I should have called it the false view, and then uh, you know no one can object. But um, naive Euclideanism. Um, it, is, you know, this is one of many statements of the view um, uh, in, a, in a famous book by uh, Green recently, axioms are mathematical statements that are self-evidently true. So if philosophy, and he's talking specifically here about ethics, but the, the same applies to philosophy. If philosophy is like math, then the philosophical truths to which we appeal in our arguments must ultimately follow from philosophical axioms, which are uh, from a manageable set of self-evident truths. Um, so, the, you know, the familiar problem with this uh, point of view is just that there doesn't seem to be any useful sense of self-evidence in which this is so. I mean, you can use the word self-evidence how you like, but, but presumably self-evidence is supposed to distinguish uh, mathematical axioms from characteristically philosophical claims more generally over which there's notorious controversy. And it just doesn't seem like that, um, uh, th that there's any way of pinning down a term, a, a, a meaning of self-evidence according to which the axioms generally have that feature, that distinguishing feature. So for example, John Mayberry writes, the set theoretic axioms that sustain modern mathematics <clears throat> are self-evident in differing degrees. The most important of them, namely so the, the so-called axiom of infinity has scarcely any claim to self-evidence at all. Uh, Boulos famously, infamously, depending on your point of view, writes, um, I am by no means convinced that any of the axioms of infinity, union, or power set force themselves upon us, or all that the axioms of replacement that we can comprehend do. There is nothing unclear about the power set axiom, for instance, but it does not seem to me unreasonable to think that it's not the case. For every set, there's a set of all its subsets. So <clears throat> the idea that we just come to the table with self-evident truths and then deduce, um, that just doesn't seem to be an accurate account of how we would actually know P for characteristically proved propositions P, <clears throat> um, even if that's the way it looks like sort of methodologically mathematics is practiced. That doesn't look to be the epistemic order of things. Um, and this idea was already um, a much, you know, a much more promising uh, point of view um, that sort of directly addressed this fact um, or this apparent fact uh, was already suggested by Bertrand Russell in his 1907 lecture on the subject called the regressive method for discovering the premises of mathematics. He, he writes, we believe the premises, in other words, the axioms of mathematics, because we can see that their consequences are true, instead of believing the consequences because we know the premises. But the inferring of premises from consequences is really the essence of induction. Thus, the method of investigating the principles of mathematics is an inductive method and is substantially the same as the method of discovering general laws in any other science. 
And, you know, today in today's lingo, we might call it an abductive method, uh, just to be clear that it's something more like inference to the best explanation in the sense of like Harmon. Goodall, of course, picked up on Russell's idea and his most famous application of, of the idea was to new axioms. Um, scroll down. Uh, but, but it's clear in other places and other parts of his writing that he agreed with Russell that this is the explanation of our knowledge of axioms generally. <clears throat> so he writes in Russell's Mathematical Logic, Russell compares the axioms of mathematics with the laws of nature and logical evidence with sense perception. So the axioms need not be evident in themselves, but rather their justifica justification lies exactly as in physics in the fact that they make it possible for these sense perceptions to be deduced. I think that this view has been largely justified by subsequent developments, and it is to be expected that it will be still more so in the future. And then among the most famous lines in philosophy of math uh, concerning new axioms, uh, Goodall writes, despite the remoteness um, from sense experience, we do have the perception also of the objects of set theory as is seen from the fact that at least some, he doesn't say at least some, but it's clear from his other writing that he, he thinks at least some axioms force themselves upon us as being true. I don't see why we should have any less confidence in this kind of perception, i.e. mathematical intuition than in sense perception, which induces us to build up physical theories and to expect that the future sense perceptions will agree with them and to believe that a question not decidable now has meaning and may be decided in the future. So, so the, uh, the naive view was we you know, just lay down some axioms. They're banal and obvious and no one could deny them. And we deduce. Um, and, uh, and the order of justification follows the order of logical implication. The Russell Goodall picture is the order of justification is, is generally opposite the order of logical implication. In general, the theorems are more epistemically basic than the axioms that prove them, even though, of course, the theorems are logically downstream from the axioms. Okay, so um, you know this is this is a view according to which um, there's uh, there's at a high level of abstraction at least a deep analogy between science and math, as Russell sorry as as um, as both Russell and Goodall point out. So you know in the scientific case, no one is inclined to be a Euclidean. Um, one can regiment different scientific theories and then prove theorems, but it's the theorems that are the data, the, the contents of the theorems. Those are something like the observation statements or the facts about the observable world, and then we infer to the best systemization of those. And so on this view, math is, is quite like empirical science. It's just that in the empirical case, you've got observations. That's the basic data. In the um, mathematical case, you've got intuitions as the basic data, but otherwise it's the same. Okay, so Benassaraf famously objected to this, and, and, and rightly so, um, that there's a, uh, there's a striking actually disanalogy, even if at that level of abstraction, um, there's a similarity. He writes, I find this picture both encouraging and troubling. What troubles me is that without an account of how the mathematical sense perceptions in Goodall's sense, um, force themselves upon us as being true. The analogy with sense perception and physical science is without much content. For what is missing is precisely an, an account of the link between our cognitive faculties and the objects known. In physical science, we have at least the start of such an account and it's causal. We accept as knowledge only those beliefs which we can appropriately relate to our cognitive faculties. Of course, there's a superficial analogy we verify axioms by deducing consequences that, from them concerning areas in which we uh, seem to have more direct perceptions or clear intuitions, but we're never told how we know even these clear perceptions to start with. So, so the idea is roughly speaking that in the empirical scientific case, we have a story about how we know the observations, the basic input to this abductive process but in the mathematical case, we have no similar story about how we know the basic data, the intuitions. So Hartree Field followed um, Ben Asaraf's paper up um, something like 15 years later with a, um, uh, with a clarification, basically a distinction um, that, that Ben Asaraf kind of obscures. And in fact, Ben Asaraf's paper is sort of ambiguous between three or four different sort of problems, not all of them epistemological. Um, but, but Field distinguishes two um, 
to epistemological problems. He writes, we should grant that there may be positive reasons for believing in the standard axioms, say. He's talking about mathematical entities, but he's talking about them uh, understood as described by the axiom. So you can just talk about truth of the axioms on a face value reading. These positive reasons might involve initial plausibility, but Benassaraf's challenge is to explain how our beliefs about these remote entities can so well reflect the facts about them. If it appears in principle impossible to explain this, and that tends to undermine the belief in mathematical entities, despite whatever reason we might have had for believing in them to start with. So here's how I interpret uh, Field's uh, distinction and, and the way of understanding Benassaraf. Uh, the, the way I understand him is to be saying that Benassaraf's challenge partitions into the following two, which Benassaraf himself didn't distinguish. The first is the challenge to explain the justification, or you know, there's lots of different words for the same basic idea, the kind of like reasonableness, the epistemic appropriateness, the praiseworthiness of belief in something like the axiom of replacement. The other is to explain the reliability. Why is it that our beliefs that you know it, it, replacement is true is a reliable symptom of how it is with, with the mathematical reality? There's another problem just to further complicate like the dialectic here, which is actually a little bit in tension with this problem, which also Ben Asaraf was sort of alluding to, though not in the passage I mentioned, which concerns the determinacy of our mathematical language. So, so you know, everyone here will be familiar with, you know, Putnam's models and reality paper. You know, th there's also sketches of that kind of worry in, in the Ben Asaraf paper. But I think, you know, something Field's saying is we need to distinguish these three. I mean, he specifically talks about the first two, but we need to distinguish these three. We also need to distinguish a, a sort of dialectical question of justifying our mathematical beliefs to someone who's, who's dubious. And that's something Field takes up in Science Without Numbers uh, when he says the only non-question begging argument for mathematical realism is, is the indispensability argument. But the point is that what Field is saying is that Benassaraf, the, the Benassaraf problem is the second. It's number two. It's the, it's the, it's the problem of explaining the reliability of our, our mathematical beliefs. It's not the problem of explaining their justification, which you might be able to do in lots of different ways. I should say defeasible justification, because of course he thinks the apparent impossibility of explaining reliability undermines that justification. Okay, so the problem, it seems to me, with this reading, just as a as, as sort of a dialectical uh, problem with, with um, a, as far as he's engaging with Goodall and Russell, is that it seems to me like Goodall is not best interpreted as trying to address the second problem at all. He's, it seems to me, best interpreted in contemporary lingo as offering a phenomenalist or dogmatist epistemology, and that is very explicitly an account of one, a, an account of what explains the justification of our beliefs of a given kind. So it's in the spirit of, for example, Jim Pryor's The Skeptic and the Dogmatists. Jim Pryor isn't concerned with psychophysics and evolutionary theory in that paper. He's concerned with the question of why is it okay for me, reasonable for me, justified for me to believe here's a hand when it looks to me like here's a hand. And what Goodall is saying, it, just like prior, is that it's something about the phenomenology. It's something about how it seems, how, it, how we experience it. There's another question, of course, why is it that when I believe that here's a hand, there tends to be a hand? And that's the, the stuff where you'll introduce psychophysics and evolutionary theory, perhaps, but that's a different issue. So, so it seems to me like this objection just misses the mark if you're trying to respond to Goodall. Um, it's not that I don't think there's a real problem there. It's just not the problem Goodall's epistemology is even pretending to speak to. So, so the upshot, it seems to me, is that the fact that we can sketch a causal account of how our empirical but not mathematical beliefs track the facts does show that we cannot answer the reliability challenge for mathematical realism in the same way as we can answer it for empirical realism. I'll come back at the end of this talk to whether we can answer it at all. Um, but, the, but the problem is that it allows that we can answer the justificatory challenge in the same way, and that's clearly, I think, the challenge that, that, that Goodall is trying to speak to. Russell might be a little less clear, but I think that's the challenge that clearly Goodall's trying to speak to. Okay. <clears throat>
However, I now want to argue that there is a problem with Gödel's epistemology, even taken on its own terms. It's a, there is a problem with his epistemology, even understood as an account of justification. And this is that intuition, uh, mathematical intuition, is not just like observation, even at the level of justification. So obviously, whatever explains the reliability of our intuitions is different than what explains the reliability of our sense perceptions. It's a different kind of subject. It would be a totally different kind of story if we are reliable. Let's hope we are. But, um, but what I'm saying is that even at the level of set aside how it is that they're reliable symptoms, even at the level of just um, intuitions themselves and perceptions themselves, there's a, the following striking difference. And the difference is that there's disagreement over the data to be accounted for in the mathematical case that has no analog, I claim, in the empirical case. So let me make a caveat before I try to make the case. The caveat is that, of course, there's not perfect agreement um, as to what's, uh, what the observational data is either. Um, our observational faculties can be impaired. Uh, moreover, observational data or observation is theory-laden. Uh, however, the, the, the disanalogy that I'm going to try to uh, bring into relief is that disagreements that arise over empirical scientific, scientific hypotheses do not seem to be primarily attributable to disagreements over the empirical data to be accounted for where something roughly like this seems to be the case in the foundations of math. So let me give an example to, to let me just sort of give a kind of characteristic example of a theoretical scientific disagreement. So, um, you know, most people accept dark matter and dark energy as a hypothesis for the, the uh, you know, unexpected observations people have found in galaxies and, and star clusters generally. Um, but that's not the only, you know, theory in town. Some people prefer to amend the mechanical laws, general relativity. The key point is nobody, as far as I'm aware, and I'm open to being corrected, but as far as I'm aware, nobody denies the observational data. Everyone grants the, the same data. There's the same findings that have been, you know, uh, found through the Hubble telescope and so forth. It's a question of what's the best systemization of that data, what to do with that data. Um, so, for example, Milgram is a famous advocate of uh, the sort of heretical position that we should amend the mechanical laws. He writes, dark matter is the only explanation for the observed mass discrepancies if we cleave to the accepted laws of physics. But if we accept a departure from these laws, we might do away with dark matter. I proposed a modification to Newton's second law that changed the relation between force and acceleration when the acceleration is low. This was the beginning of the idea of uh, MOND, that is Modified Newtonian Dynamics. Okay, so I take that to just be a kind of characteristic theoretical scientific disagreement. I mean, it, you know, I, it, I can't think of a single paper where a sort of fundamental deep scientific question was of the form, you seem to see P and I don't see P. Of course, there's lots of, of the form, this is a reasonable, in, P is a reasonable inference from what you see or what we have seen as a community and you don't think so, but that's different. That's the sort of, you know, characteristic case. Now I just want to contrast that typical scientific disagreement with what we actually see in the foundations of math. Just, you know, survey some quotations that I think are representative, but, um, you know, uh, that's also something we can talk about. So, um, so here's Bulos in the same uh, paper talking about placement. I mean, he's not talking about replacement, but I assume that's what he's worried about. And that's the one he focuses on because I assume that he doesn't actually want to deny a union or something. He says, let me try to be as accurate, explicit and forthright about my belief in the existence of kappa, the least ordinal greater than all fi, where f zero is a left sub naught and fi plus one is a left sub fi as I can. I think it probably doesn't exist. I'm also doubtful that anything could be provided that should be called a reason that would settle the question. With regard to the axiom of choice, Thomas Forrester in his forthcoming book uh, writes, without any doubt, the most problematic axiom of set theory is the axiom of choice. The current situation with the axiom of choice is that the contestants have agreed to differ. 
on the axiom of foundation, Rieger writes, ZF does not embody a philosophically coherent notion of set. There's a coherent constructivist position. There's also a co coherent anti-constructivist position, but ZF is an uneasy compromise between these two. It pays lip service to constructivism without really meaning it. Only a non-well-founded set theory, one that's inconsistent with foundation, uh, can be shown to modify the naive conception as much as, but no more than is required. And of course, the main area where we see in most of the literature discussion of disagreement and the kinds of considerations that are brought to bear is concerning new axioms, extensions of ZFC. The, 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 you know, the most famous, I think, example of this, which you know, Penelope Maddy did a beautiful job of explaining the sort of California school uh, position on this, um, uh, was, was V equals L versus a measurable cardinal. But of course, there are people who don't accept the California school's position on this. So here is, um, for example, Harvey Friedman. Set theorists say that V equals L has implausible consequences. Uh, I assume he's talking specifically about dis descriptive set theorists in the California school. Uh, they claim to have a direct intuition, which allows them to view these as so implausible that this provides evidence against V equals L. However, mathematicians like me disclaim such direct intuition about complicated sets of uh, reals. Many say they have no direct intuition about all multivariate functions from n on to n and so forth. Um, okay, so it seems to me that, you know, if you look at paradigmatic scientific disagreements, especially in physics, those are the ones I'm most familiar with, but, but I, you know, it seems to me like this is quite general in empirical science. What you get is, yeah, there's agreement over the observations made, even, you know, heretics about climate science, uh, you know, agree about the data collected, the, the, the disagreement tends to be over what to make of that data. By contrast, it doesn't seem to me like that's the most sympathetic way to understand quotations like I just considered. That's not to say no disagreements are of that sort. Certainly some are. Sometimes there's cases where people agree on sort of what the plausible consequences are, and it's a, there's a disagreement about how best to systematize those. My worry is that that doesn't seem to be the general case. Uh, people see the, the general case seems to be sort of just quite different gestalt impressions, or to use the language of Jensen, fundamental difference in mathematical taste, he, as he put it in inner models and large cardinals. Uh, by the way, someone else who's sympathetic to V equals L, of course, because um, he's done such great work on it. Okay, so a caveat I need to make is that diagnosis, this is from a different context, this is a, uh, Andreas Mogensen talking about ethics, but the same point applies. Diagnosing a clash of intuitions will typically involve attempting a careful hermeneutic reconstruction of the underlying dialectic designed to reveal that the dis, uh, dispute rests ultimately with certain premises that one side finds intuitive and the other does not. Any such reconstruction is bound to be controversial. That's as much true in the ethical case as it is in the mathematical. Famously, people like Derek Parfit thought that we all had the same moral intuitions and all moral disagreement was just a failure to sort of work out their consequences. So, so this is always a move one can make. It's a question of, is that the most plausible move? Whereas many philosophers agree that some questions boil down to differences in tuition, there's considerable disagreement as to exactly which questions these are. And that's certainly true in the mathematical case too. And as I'll be talking at the end, it's true in the, in the philosophical case more generally. It's true in the you know, theory of modality, the theory of meta-logic, um, uh, and, and the theory of grounding. I mean, sort of choose your favorite uh, philosophical subject. Okay. So, so what I've argued then is that, you know, there's this initial epistemology. I take it really to be something like the only game in town once you talk about set theory generally and move beyond sort of banal claims of like arithmetic or geometry. And it seems to be the one in the background of, you know, the work of Wooden and Kallner and people who think there's a serious question as to, for example, whether the continuum hypothesis is true. And that's this kind of abductive methodology, according to which at an abstract level, uh, the epistemology of set theory is a lot like the epistemology of empirical science. Objection, there's a big difference, namely the explanation of the reliability of our perceptions is, is, is causal and we have no analogous story in the, in the mathematical case. Reply, that's not what the good old Russell epistemology is trying to 
um, illuminate. That's not the problem it's trying to solve. It's trying to explain the justification of our mathematical beliefs. It's basically a dogmatist or phenomenalist theory in epistemology, and those don't speak to reliability. That's a different issue, which I'm going to come back to. Okay, response to that Actually, there seems to be a big difference between science and math, even at the level of justification. Namely, there seems to be a lot of disagreement over intuitions and not very much disagreement over observations. More carefully still, disagreements in the foundations of math seem primarily or largely to turn on disagreement and intuition, whereas disagreements in, in science do not seem primarily to turn on disagreement and observation, even if you could find some strange cases. Okay, how might somebody respond to this alleged disanalogy? Okay, the first way it seems to me is to argue that controversial mathematical intuitions are really more like controversial observational ones. I said before, observation is theory laden, and to say anything interesting about the world, you're going to have to put it in a language that's going to involve commitments that, is, that are, in principle, controversial. So, so these observations, these, these mathematical observations, the intuitions, they're theoretical. So disagreement over whether there are more subsets than L allows, for example, or whether there's a measurable cardinal, or whether all projective sets are determined, that's more like disagreement over the extent to which, say, a biopsy sample harbors dysplasia, or say, high-grade dysplasia rather than low-grade dysplasia. Something that's an observational matter, it's people looking through microscopes and claiming that's high-grade dysplasia or not, but it's notoriously controversial, and that's why people are after better technology so that you don't have to re rely on uh, pathologist judgments of the grade of dysplasia. Okay, the problem, it seems to me, with this idea is that in the empirical case, we can contrast observational judgments of, for example, the degree of dysplasia with what you might call practically bedrock judgments about the overt appearance of a biopsy stamp, uh, sample stated in neutral terms, like not very circular or something. So, you know, um, it, it, you know, in the lab, um, th there's going to be some language everyone will agree to. You know, skepticism is not on the table. You know, fictionalism isn't on the table. Um, everyone agrees that, okay, yeah, that's not very circular, but I don't think that's a case of high grade dysplasia. I do. But in the mathematical case, it seems to me very hard to find anything that might play an analogous role as the practically bedrock. So, Let's just review some things people say. So Vile famously uh, maintained that it will be recognized that in any wording, the least upper bound axiom of the calculus is false. Edward Nelson begins his book, Predicate of Arithmetic, that the reason for mis uh, mistrusting the induction principle is that it involves an impredicative concept of number. A number is conceived to be an object satisfying every inductive formula. So the idea is circular. Uh, Zielberger says, I am a Platonist, but I deny even the piano axiom that every integer has a successor. And actually, Nelson distinguishes between genetic numbers and formal numbers, and he has a worry like that, too, about genetic numbers. Harvey Friedman writes, I've seen some go so, go so far as to challenge the existence of two to the 100, and so forth. So... It seems to me like it's just, you know, these are all like, you know, employed professionals. <laughs> it's, and and, and um, there might be something wrong with them. Some of them might just sort of be wearing the, you know, the wrong glasses when it comes to, you know, looking at the forms. But this is not, it seems to me, analogous to what goes on in empirical science. So disagreements over whether impredicative definitions are okay in analysis, say, don't seem to turn on you know, there's some common intuitions, and we're just disagreeing about how best to systematize them in the way somebody might in the case of, um, you know, dark matter. And if somebody says, okay, yeah, but, but that's because these are theoretical intuitions, so what you really need to compare them to are theoretical observations, I say, well, what are the non-theoretical intuitions in the math case, whereas there seem to be a lot in the empirical case? Um, okay. So, so obviously in this, I've appealed to a notion that I've called practically bedrock observations, and I'm not pretending that's a precise notion. I don't think it needs to be for the point I'm trying to make, but obviously that's a vague notion and going to admit of, 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 of dubious cases, borderline cases. 
Okay, the second argument that I can imagine trying to challenge this alleged uh, disanalogy I'm pressing is that um, that people with the heretical intuitions are in the overwhelming minority. They're like the climate scientists who don't believe in climate change or something. Just like people with heretical observation judgments. Moreover, this sociological fact, somebody might say, this kind of poll number, this fact about the poll numbers, that affords defeasible evidence that the heretics are wrong and the rest of us are right. And, and you see sort of coy appeals to poll numbers all the time in the literature. Um, nobody seems willing to stick their neck out and say, I hereby take this to be evidence for anything, but it's pretty clear that's what's going on. So for example, if Peter Kohlner in his survey article writes, projected determinacy has gained wide acceptance by set theorists who know the details of the constructions and theorems involved uh, in the case that's been made for projective determinacy. The first problem, it seems to me, with this suggestion is that the relevant group of people, uh, if we're going to take poll numbers into account, if we're going to you know, take a poll, it seems like the relevant people to poll are the people who work on the disputed axioms and intimately related matters, not your typical mathematician. As uh, uh, what's his, uh, Keith Devlin says in a, said in a paper um, from the 80s, he said, you know, if I, you know, he was another some person sympathetic to V equals L. And he said, you know, if I were to take a poll of mathematicians generally, I think most of them would buy into v, v equals L, but most set theorists would be against it. And of course he was a set theorist, not a mathematician generally. But the point is like most set theorists I take it would say, well, who cares about the mathematicians generally? They don't really know anything about set theory and they don't really care. What matters is the people who know what they're talking about. The problem, of course, as anyone in philosophy knows, is that the more you know what you're talking about, the more dubious all of the options become, the more uncertain you become. And this is, you know, something that Russell said in the philosophy of logical atomism. He said, um, you know, specialist knowledge seems to turn something, and he was specifically talking about philosophy here, but, but specialist knowledge seems to turn something so simple as to not seem worth stating into something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. He said, I hope that by the end of this, uh, you know, you, you feel like everything's so paradoxical that you won't believe it. The point is that the people who have doubts about choice are the people who are familiar with the arguments for and against choice, the people who have gone down that rabbit hole. The people who don't tend to have doubts about choice are the people who kind of don't feel like they need to go there. Um, but why would the poll numbers among people who know a lot less about something, about some subject and the dialectic about it, why would those be relevant as opposed to the poll numbers about the people who actually have gotten into the weeds and know the back and forth? So for so Thomas Forster, again, in the same forthcoming book writes, look, for people who want to think about foundational issues as resolved, standard axioms provide an excuse for them not to think about them any longer. It's a bit like the role of the church in medieval Europe. It keeps, keeps a lid on things that really need lids. And Bell and Hellman write, contrary to the popular misconception of mathematics as a cut and dried body of universally agreed upon truths, as soon as one examines the foundations of mathematics, the question of what axioms are true, what logic is correct, uh, one encounters divergence of viewpoint that can easily remind one of religious schismatic controversy. So, so I don't see that argument going very far. Um, the second problem, though, with the argument, even if you weren't persuaded that this is a problem, is that even if poll numbers mattered in the empirical case, so even if you could say, for example, and I actually happen to think this is a lot more plausible, that, you know, the vast majority of cosmologists accept the dark matter hypothesis as opposed to the amendment of general relativity, therefore that's probably true. It's hard to see how they could matter in armchair cases like pure mathematics. And the basic reason is that there doesn't seem to be a reason to suppose that the truth of set theoretic intuitions would be pop, or that tr the true set theoretic intuitions would be popular independent of an assumption as to which ones are right. Whereas in the empirical case, you can make some kind of sketch of a story. Roughly speaking, look, it's not a shock that our perceptions would be generally reliable because we probably wouldn't have been super successful at passing on our genes if they weren't. In some sense, our empirical theories are extrapolations from those. So we shouldn't be that surprised 
um, we should expect, you know, roughly speaking, that the true observational judgments would be popular. Now, of course, that becomes less and less plausible the more theoretical the, the view, the more extrapolation from the observations, but something like that's plausible. It's very hard to imagine what an alter, you know, what an analogous argument could be. I mean, it just doesn't seem like it would be very plausible to be reliable about choice or projective determinacy. Now, somebody might say, well, it would be it would be useful to be reliable about, you know, finite sets and you know, choice is an extrapolation from the finite case of the infinite or something. But what the actual science shows is that it would be beneficial to be reliable about extremely rudimentary things, not even things that are it's you could sensibly formalize as claims about numbers. So, so I don't see a promising argument from like what it would be rely, uh, beneficial for us to to be reliable about in our the in our you know among objects in our surroundings to anything approximating the axioms we actually believe. Whereas it's not totally unbelievable that you could do that in the empirical scientific case. In general, it seems like if you want to know how come somebody believes something in the, in the mathematical case, for those very few mathematicians and logicians who take seriously the question of what axioms are true, the story is very much like the story we worry about in philosophy when we say, oh no, I just believe epistemological internalism because I went to grad school here rather than there. As, Mar as Donald Martin puts it, for individual mathematicians, acceptance of an axiom is probably often the result of nothing more than knowing that it's a standard axiom. Uh, uh, Paul Cohen writes, the attitudes people will profess towards the foundations of mathematics seems to be greatly influenced by their training and their, and their environment. This is just the kind of worry that the literature on contingency of our beliefs and, and how it should affect our credences in philosophy uh, has, has focused. And, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be a sociologist to notice the striking uh, correlations between who somebody advisor was and what kinds of views they seem to be sympathetic to, if they're sympathetic to views at all on these issues. Okay, the third argument against the disanalogy I'm trying to press is that the justified intuitions are the ones whose contents are independent, sorry, indispensable to our empirical scientific theories, just like our justified, just like the justified observational ones are. That's what breaks the parity between the bad observation, sorry, the bad intuitions and the good intuitions. The problem with this, of course, is even if you wanted to make that argument, what you'd end up with is not an account of the justification of our mathematical intuitions generally, but rather an account of the justification for extremely fringe positions on what claims are true. So famously, for example, Quine said, uh, he was a, you know, a reluctant Platonist. Uh, he thought that we have to make use of math and science. There's no getting around it. But we don't have to make use of large cardinals and so forth. And he, he, he writes, I recognize indenumerable infinities only because they are forced on me by the simplest known systemizations of more welcome ma matters. Magnitudes in excess um, of such demands as Beth Omega or inaccessible cardinals, I look upon as mathematical recreation without ontological rights. Actually, you don't have to get to large cardinals. Beth Omega is provable in ZFC. So he, he's skeptical even of ZFC on, on the basis of what you need for science. Of course, Pfefferman has gone further and said, if you really want to talk about what you need for science, you need a whole lot less than that. He thinks that Vial's system, W, something that he's uh, developed in different papers, exhausts what's indispensable for empirical science and goes further and says W itself can be treated in an instrumental way. Its entities outside the natural numbers regarded as theoretical entities and the justification for its use lies in whatever the justification is for uh, the, the, the mere use of piano arithmetic. So we need only believe in piano arithmetic as far as the math for science goes. And then of course, there's the extreme position um, of Hartree Field and others that at the end of the day, we're not going to need any math um, to formulate scientific theories, even though um, it's obviously very useful to, and practicing scientists are never going to give it up. So Field writes, we can avoid all appeal to mathematical entities and explanations when the chips are down. It must be possible, for instance, to develop theoretical physics without any appeal to mathematical entities, 
and his, you know, he has different reasons for this, but one of the main reasons is a reason that does resonate, I think, with people who, um, you know, are not generally worried about philosophy of math, which is just, if the mathematical entities are indispensable, what role are they playing? You know, why would it be necessary to cite something outside of space-time, something without sp spatio-temporal properties, in order to explain, you know, the features of some mechanical system? It seems like surely that's somehow just a placeholder. It's just a way of representing the intrinsic features of the system. That's the sort of intuition. The second problem, of course, with this, this point uh, is that the suggestion that indispensability is a guide to truth in the first place itself appears to turn on intuitions whose contents are not so indispensable. And that's a point that George Beeler made in a, in a famous uh, paper in the 90s. Okay, so it doesn't seem to me like the obvious disanal or sorry, the obvious responses to the argument I've made stand up to scrutiny. And so the upshot, if what I've said is right, is that even at the level of justification then, mathematical knowledge is not actually just like scientific knowledge. I mean, of course, everyone knows that mathematical knowledge isn't like scientific knowledge in the sense that one has observations, the other has intuitions. I'm saying that um, even the analogy that Goodall and Russell are trying to maintain, not about explaining reliability, but about explaining justification, even that analogy is suspect. Rather than resembling empirical science, it seems to me mathematics and metalogic, uh, because this is actually where um, it's, it's the case of metalogic, where Goodman introduced the idea of reflective equilibrium or something kind of like inference to the best explanation, seems more closely to resemble just paradigmatic old philosophy, the bad stuff, <laughs> the stuff where we argue all the time. So, you know, Lewis writes, our intuitions are simply opinions. Our philosophical theories are the same. Some are commonsensical, some are sophisticated, some are particular, some are general, some are more firmly held, some less. A reasonable goal for a philosopher is to bring them into equilibrium. Our common task is to find out uh, what equilibria there are that can withstand examination. But it remains for each of us to come to rest at one or another of them. And there, we're generally going to be coming to rest at different places. Cartwright writes of, you know, questions of essence and possibility. The grounds on which uh, ratings of attributes as essential or accidental are to be made are obscure. One is simply to reflect on the question of whether the object in question uh, could or could not have had the attribute in question. But the criteria to which we appe uh, to one, one appeals in such reflection are sufficiently obscure to leave me at least with an embarrassingly large number of undecided cases. And you could multiply this in the grounding literature, whether, you know, these cases are supposed to be violations of transitivity or not, or, uh, you know, the ethical literature, blah, blah, blah. The, you know, this is the norm in philosophy, disagreement and intuition. So um, although this objection, if what I've said is correct, this, this, this claim that even at the level of justification, uh, math is not just like empirical science, tends to undercut the Russell Goodall analogy with science, it remains open what to make of it. So, so okay, so there's not this analogy, even at the level of justification. So what, what does that mean? So one thing it could mean, one thing you might think it means, is that um, that that you know we should we should be you know we should be more skeptical of our mathematical beliefs than um, than we would like to be. Uh, just like people sometimes say we should be when we learn that you know we would have had different uh, epistemological intuitions had we gone to a different grad school. Either because disagreement in intuition per se is an underminer by itself, that is sometimes maintained in other areas, or because um, disagreement in intuition is evidence that we can't answer the reliability challenge, that second challenge I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. However, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your uh, preferences, I, it seems to me like this is just not a tenable position because down this path lies empirical skepticism. There's no way, way to quarantine the, the philosophical skepticism. So if disagreement and intuition one way or another is undermining, that's going to be an invitation to just general skepticism because our empirical theories are up to their ears in you know, at least met some basic metalogic, some basic arithmetic about consistency and so forth. 
um, uh, modality theories of possibility and necessity, um, you know, basically philosophical claims over which there's disagreement, over which that disagreement turns on intuition. So if this is undermining, it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to put it on the shelf and leave it for the philosophers to worry about. It's going to infect our endorsement of something like the standard model of particle physics. However, um, uh, that's not to say that we just sit tight and say that, um, uh, that you know, so, there, so there's no problem. There is a problem. And it seems to me like there's a way of having our cake and eating it too. And this is already sort of um, an idea that's, you know, familiar from the mathematical context. It's been articulated in different ways by Mark Bolliger, Joel Hampkins, um, Linsky and Zalta. And the idea would be to have this point of view sort of across the board, across the armchair, uh, the subjects. So I personally favor a pluralist approach to armchair subjects like math, metalogic, modality. According to this, while armchair questions answer to an independent reality, because if we were to give up on that idea, then given the indispensability of all that stuff to science, we'd be giving up on the idea that science answer, answers to an independent reality. And I'm not ready to go there myself. Um, Armchair, unlike empirical reality, is so rich as to wit witness any answers uh, we might have given. That's rough, but that's the rough. I that's the idea. Hence, conflicts of intuition may just, in this case, be merely appear apparent. The advocate of choice and the advocate of determinacy they can go both go ha home happy, like an advocate of the parallel postulate and the advocate of its negation, understood as pure mathematical conjecture. Hence, conflicts of intuition, yeah, may be merely apparent, and our reliability can be explained in a non-causal way. Basically, if you think of the problem as, say, the problem of showing that our beliefs are safe, we couldn't have easily had false beliefs because we, had we accepted different sentences, we would have believed, believed different propositions, and those are true right, right along with the original ones we actually believe. Because mathematical, metalogical, modal reality is so rich as to witness any point of view we might have taken. Um, as as Beale uh, puts it um, in a in discussing Bolliger's view, he says, um, but, but I'm talking now about armchair reality generally. It's so inclusive that one's cognitive fa faculties can't miss, as it were. If you're having trouble hitting the target, just make your target bigger. That's the idea. So pluralism, as I'm sketching it here, it's a kind of transposition of Carnap's conventionalism to the key of realism. It's a perfectly realist view. I don't think we get to make up the mathematical facts or the logical facts or any of that stuff because we don't get to make up the scientific facts and science is up to its ears and all of that. However, although uh, the metaphysics is totally different, although it's perfectly independent, it's so rich that the practical upshot is the same as it would be if we believed with Carnap that by laying down some conventions, you can bring facts into the world. As Carnap puts it, the conflict between divergent views disappears and before us lies the boundless ocean of unlimited possibilities. So basically the disagreements go away. The only questions left are practical ones about which concepts to use for a purpose. So that's it, thanks.